Hi, I'm Gavin Nyman. I'm a senior lecturer of the University of Adelaide and I'm also an orthopaedic surgeon. And I'm going to take you through the hand and wrist examination. I'll start by saying the hands are a very functional structure of the human body. The dexterity of the hand enables us to perform many intricate tasks. Many pathologies and conditions can affect the function of the hand and impair the ability to perform daily tasks. The hand and wrist conditions can be divided up into elective and traumatic conditions. And today I'm going to take you through the hand and wrist examination to identify the relevant clinical signs to diagnose a range of, of common clinical scenarios. The hand and wrist examination is a Komonowski scenario and I'll demonstrate a structured way to approach the examination. The examination of the hand and wrist follows the structure of look, feel, move and then special tests, followed by the functional tests in order to perform a functional and thorough assessment of the human hand function. As with any other examination, Introduce yourself to the patient and confirm their identity and verbally consent for the examination. Make sure you perform hand hygiene before examining the patient. After the introduction, you will expose and position the patient for the examination. For a hand and wrist examination, have your patient in short sleeves or roll up their sleeves to above the elbow for adequate exposure to the hands, wrists and elbows. Position the patient seated with his or her hands resting on a pillow. It's important to perform a general inspection of the patient to state the obvious such as gross abnormalities, the presence of an immobilisation cast, aids and adaptions. A good observation of the hands can provide you with a lot of information about the pathology. Just remember to look at the dorsum and the palms. Look for the normal cascade of the fingers. Abnormal posturing of these fingers such as clawing should be noted and examined further. Begin by looking at the skin of the hands. Look for obvious Dupuytron's disease. Look for the colour of the skin which can tell a lot. Ethemonous skin could suggest cellulitis, while white skin can indicate arterial insufficiency, whereas blue and purplish skin might be due to venous congestion or bruising. Do not ignore pigmented lesions as it can be a melanoma, and sometimes psoriatic changes can be seen in the fingernails, as can other generalised medical problems. Note any scars or wounds in the hands. They can tell you about the history of the hand. A longitudinal scar at the wrist crease may suggest a previous carpal tunnel release. Locations of wound can suggest the injury of underlying structures. For example, a deep cut at the middle phalanx may suggest an injury to the flexor digitorum profundus tendon, but may spare the tendon of the flexor digitorum superficialis. So you will expect to find weakness of DIP flexion in the examination. Atrophy of muscle groups in the hands indicate denervation of respective nerves. The main groups are the thena, median nerve, hypothena eminences, and interosseous muscles, ulnar nerve. Features suggestive of rheumatoid arthritis are ulnar deviation of the MCP joints, swan neck deformities, Z-thumb deformities and boutonniere deformities. Osteoarthritis usually has the clinical signs of chronic changes in the joint resulting in either Hebden's and Bouchard's nodes in the PRP and DRP joints, while scalp can produce some gouty tophi in the subcutaneous tissues. Moving on to feeling or palpation of the hand, it's important to ask the patient if there's any pain in the wrist or hand before touching them. The first thing to feel is the temperature of the joints. Feeling the wrist, MCP joints and IP joints for warmth. I suggest the start of the distal radial carpal region starting at the radial styloid. Checking the anatomical snuff box, both dorsally and volarwards and the scaphoid tubercle. In this area you can feel the radial styloid region, the scaphoid, the scaphoid trapezial joint and then the base of the metacarpal leading into the carpal metacarpal region. We then move more centrally across to the scapholunate region, then the lunotriquetral joint, and then over to the ulnarwards towards the distal ulna and the distal radial ulna joint, and the region distally, the triangular fibro cartilage. If you move dorsal to that, you'll feel the extensive carpi ulnaris tendon, and volarwards, there's the pisiformer triquetral joint, which can become arthritic. We then move more distally along the metacarpals and the phalanges, palpating the MCP and IP joints. I recommend a bimanual palpation method here to feel for warmth, tenderness, bulkiness, swelling and bone spurs. When palpating the joints, we keep looking at their facial expressions for pain reaction, looking for synovitis and tenderness in the hands as well. We then move to move. In this next region, we assess the range of motion of the hands and wrists together and compare both sides for restricted range of motion. We'll examine the active movements first. If the patient is unable to perform a full active range of movements, we then assess passive movements to identify the restricted movements that are due to joint pathology or neuromuscular deficits. Starting from the wrist, extension, flexion, radial and ulnar deviation,
supination and pronation performed. Whilst doing supination and pronation, the distal radial ulnar joint is palpated, assessing if this is the cause of pain. Moving to the finger joints, flexion and extension are performed for the MCP and IP joints, as well as assessing the range of carpal metacarpal motion of the thumb, including abduction and adduction, extension and flexion. If there is abnormal motion or lack of it, we then assess the passive motion of that particular region. During active and passive movements, we'll feel for crepitus of the joints and tendons. If passive motion is restricted, we suspect abnormalities of the joints or tendon adhesion. If passive motion is full, but active motion is restricted, this suggests that either a tendon injury has occurred or there is a neurological issue. Individual tendons can then be assessed, starting with flexor digitorum profundus to the digits, assessing flexion of the tip of the fingers with the PIP joint in extension. Flexor digitorum superficialis can also be assessed by assessing flexion of the PIP joint with the proximal phalanx in extension. Flexor profundus longus can be assessed by testing the thumb IP flexion, whilst extensor indices to the index finger and extensor pollicis longus to the thumb can be assessed by individual extension of the index finger and thumb respectively. Extensor digitorum communis is tested by assessing digit extension of the individual digits. Moving on to special tests, many of the special tests are used to confirm the clinical findings in the hand examination. The choice of special tests is guided by the impression on the presentation and examination up to this point. The Finkelsteiner's test is a test for assessing for de Quervain's tenosynovitis, which is also called first dorsal compartment tendonitis. It is performed by flexing the thumb, metacarpal and metacarpal phalangeal joint and proximal phalanx into the palm whilst ulnar deviating the wrist. It is positive if pain is experienced over the radial stole load in doing so and is pathognomic of first extensor tenosynovitis, also known as de Quervain's. Pain felt just distal to the scaphoid tubercle can suggest carpometacarpal arthritis. The carpometacarpal joint grind test is performed by grabbing the first metacarpal with a hand and applying some axial load along the metacarpal. This test is positive when pain is reproduced at the carpometacarpal joint. Bernal's test is used to evaluate the cause of PIP joint restriction. To perform the test, simply flex the PIP joint passively with the MCP joint extended and also do it whilst the MCP joint is flexed. If the flexion of the POB joint is restricted in both positions, then capsular restriction is implicated. If the POP joint can flex more in MCP flexion, then lumbrical muscle tightness is implicated. Watson's test is used to check for scapulina instability. While seated and with the elbow flexed to 90 degrees, if examining the right wrist, your thumb from your left hand is placed directly over the scaphoid tubercle and applies dorsal pressure on the scaphoid tubercle, thus reducing the scaphoid. The other hand is placed on the dorsum of the wrist and your hand used to radial and ulnar deviate the wrist. The test is positive if a palpable clunk is felt over the scaphalina region with an associated pain felt whilst doing this. Triangular fibrocartilage injury is best assessed with a stress test. With the forearm in pronation, grasp the hand and ulnar deviate the wrist applying a stress test or forced axial load to the distal ulnar region of the hand in a grind, grinding fashion to try and grind or entrap the tear of the triangular fibrocartilage between the proximal lunate and the distal ulna. It is positive if it reproduces pain over the triangular fibrocartilage region. A major cause of issues in the hand and wrist is nerve entrapment. Common conditions are cubital tunnel with the ulnar nerve trapped behind the medial epicondylar region of the elbow or carpal tunnel syndrome with the median nerve entrapped in the flexor crease or flexor underneath the flexor retinaculum of the wrist. The Tenel's test can be performed over both regions by tapping or percussing the nerve as it runs in these regions. It is positive when percussion over the area of entrapment reproduces paresthesia distally along the nerve region supplied. Another test for carpal tunnel syndrome or median nerve entrapment of the wrist the Phelan's test, which requires the patient to flex their wrist for 30 seconds, which will reproduce paresthesia in the median nerve distribution. A simple way to do this is to by applying dorsal pressure to the both wrists by pushing the two hands together and bending the elbows down to 90 degrees. The opposite to the praying position. A positive test is when the symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome are reproduced. It is also important to assess vascularity of the hand, 
and the most appropriate test is called Allen's test for collateral perfusion. Performed by occluding both the radial and ulnar arteries by applying pressure to both these arteries using the index and long fingers of the examiner's hand, the patient is then asked to clench the fist tightly. On releasing or straightening the fingers out of the fist, the hand remains powerful. One of the examiner's digits is then released, either releasing the radial or the ulnar artery, and the time for perfusion is assessed. The test is repeated, releasing the opposite artery, test perfusion. An abnormal result occurs when one of the arteries takes a lot longer to perfuse the hand than the other. Normal perfusion should take less than 6 seconds to occur. It's also important to assess the neurology in the hand. There are three main nerves that supply the hand. The radial nerve, the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. These supply different sensory areas of the hand, with the radial nerve supplying the classic dorsal web space, the median nerve supplying the, the radial three and a half digits on the palmar side, and the ulnar nerve supplying the ulnar one and a half digits, both dorsally and volowards. Generally, we check with superficial sensation primarily, but if there is any concern, Pain sensation and proprioception can also be tested, but not normally in a standard hand and wrist examination. When assessing motor function, we consider the same three nerves as supplying motor control to the hand. When it comes to the assessment of the motor supply to the hand, the median, radial and ulnar nerves need to be assessed. The median nerve is assessed by assessing the power of the production of the thumb, thus assessing the thena muscles. But there is a branch of the median nerve called the anteroosteous nerve, which supplies flexion of the thumb the FPL tendon, and the flexion of the index finger, the FTP tendon to the index finger, and thus the OK sign can be assessed as a part of this. Whilst the patient makes an OK sign, the examiner places his fingers between the thumb and the index finger and tries to pull their finger out between the finger and thumb, whilst the patient prevents the examiner from doing so by keeping the index finger and the thumb distal phalanx flexed. When it comes to assessing the radial nerve, extension of the wrist, i.e. extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis, can be assessed. Well, the branch off the radial nerve is the post interosseous nerve, and this supplies extension of the, of the index finger and the thumb, in particular the EI tendon or the extensor pollicis longus. The best assessment for this is to assess the extensor indices by doing the pointing sign. Finally, it comes to assessing the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve supplies the interosseous muscles and can be tested by asking the patient to make a star by spreading the fingers and thumbs of both hands and then pushing the the two little fingers against each other and assessing the ability to maintain abduction of the little fingers. An alternative way to assess ulnar function in the hand is Froman's test, where the hands are placed together in a parallel fashion with the thumbs pointing to the ceiling and the metacarpal phalangeal joints of both hands are flexed to 90 degrees and a piece of paper is placed between the thumb and the radial border of the index fingers. And the patient is asked to, ma to maintain or hold the piece of paper between the thumb and index finger radial border without bending the tip of the thumb distal phalanx, i.e. by doing adduction of the thumb into the palm. A positive test is if the patient needs to flex the distal phalanx of the thumb to prevent the piece of paper pulling out from between the finger and the thumb. The final part of the assessment of the hand and wrist examination is function. This can be done at the beginning of the assessment prior to doing these individual tests. I prefer to perform this at the end. Assessment of the function of the hand is important to identify the impact of conditions on the day-to-day -day living. Rheumatological conditions can particularly impact the function of the hand, thus this test is quite important. Some clinicians prefer to perform the functional assessment of the hand at the beginning of the assessment of the hand. From an orthopedic point of view, we tend to do it at the end. There are five main functional tests. The first functional assessment is power grip. This assesses the patient's grip strength by asking them to grip your fingers with their hand. The second one is the pinch grip, or asking a patient to assess the ability to hold a pen in the form of a pincer grip. The next one is a key, key grip, asking the patient to hold a key between the side of the index finger and using their thumb, and, and perform a rotation motion as, in, as if to unlock a lock. The fourth assessment is the ability to, to use their, a large object in their hands. This is tested by asking the patient to open the lid of a jar. And finally, there's the hook strength, this is such as when holding a shopping bags and ask the patient to hold the fingers in the form of a hooks and try to pull your fingers out through their fingers, thus trying to break the hook strength. Finally, it's also important to examine the neck before finishing the examination because neurological deficits in the hand can be referred from the cervical spine such as a C8 radiculopathy being confused for ulnar nerve injury and C6 radiculopathy being confused for carpal tunnel. 
A good way of assessing the cervical spine, particularly as a screening test, is doing Sperling's test with extension, lateral flexion and lateral rotation of the cervical spine, narrowing the neuroforamen and seeing if this reproduces paresthesia into the hand in a particular region. This concludes the hand and wrist examination. Stay to the structure of look, feel, move and special tests and you'll not miss out important things in the examination. It's obviously quite extensive and on some occasions you may not need to perform all aspects of the examination to find the diagnosis. Thank you very much.